Latin body. And so this is where the body of the Lord is consecrated, on the corporal. And so the priest will place all of the, the vessels that contain the host, the cups with the wine, and the chalice. You know, if it's a daily mass and, they're, I'm not, and we're not offering the precious blood, it'll just be the chalice and the patent, the chalice having the wine and the water. But it'll all be done on the corporal. All the events that take place on the altar take place on the corporal. So now we have the chalice, the patent, the host, the corporal, and the purificator. Also, we, to cover the chalice, we have a, what's called a chalice pall. And it's very practical. I mean, it looks very nice. It covers the chalice. But remember that in the, in the great grand cathedrals of, of Europe and the uh, Middle Ages, that they were very open and there was no screens. So you had, you had flies all over the place. And so to uh, prevent having a fly get into the precious blood, the chalice would be covered with a pall. So it has a very practical purpose. Really, that's basically its, its main reason. It looks nice and it kind of stacks nicely, but it really has a practical purpose. Okay? So these are the accoutrements of the altar. Finally, um, or not finally, but additionally, we have water and wine. Those are, two, those are the elements that must be present in order to uh, confect or make present our Lord Jesus Christ. Bread made out of wheat and prepared without leaven, without yeast. Unleavened wheat bread, because that's the bread, that the kind of bread that Jesus used on the night of the Passover, and grape wine. It, can, it can't be dandelion wine or strawberry wine. It has to be grape wine. It can be white, it can be red, but it has to be wine that's prepared from grapes. And it has to be alcoholic. It can't be grape juice. It has to have a certain alcoholic content. I think it's six or eight percent is the minimum. It has to have an alcoholic content because again, that's what was used. I've heard people say that Jesus used grape juice at the Passover. They didn't know the Jewish customs if they said that. I'll tell you that right now. Okay, so these things will usually come a little bit later. I'll talk about the ciborium afterward. Then now is a time for the second procession of the Mass. Remember the first one is the entrance of the priest and the, the deacons, the altar servers. That's the first procession. Now is the second procession, and this is where the people come forward and bring the gifts. And those people who are selected, they're people who have are representing you. They're coming forward on your behalf to offer the gifts. Now, th some things have changed. It used to be in the early church that it was an agrarian society and people didn't deal in money. There was no coinage or very little coinage. Most of the business transactions that took place were done by bartering, people giving uh, whatever they had in exchange for something they needed from someone else. And so when people came to church, they brought bread, they brought wine, they brought produce, and they brought food because the priest needed to eat. He was supported by the people. And then he would also, whatever he didn't use, he gave away to the poor, to the people who needed. So th these were gifts. The gifts were usually brought up in baskets and they were presented at the front of the altar. Now, that's, a lot of that has changed. And so now, we ask people to donate money to support the church by financially contributing to the upkeep of the church. By the way, the ideal for Catholics is to tithe 5% of your income to the church and 5% for whatever other charitable causes you feel moved to support. That's, those are the guidelines that the, bishop has set, the bishops have set forth for us. We're still moving into that, that as a church. Because if you notice from what I read, 
the, in, the, in that section from the Acts of the Apostles, the model in the early church was you gave everything. You didn't tithe. Tithing was an Old Testament concept. The model for the early church is you, every, everyone held everything in common and you received from what you need, but you gave all that you had. That was the model. Today, of course, that's not the model. Everyone has their own bank account. Everyone has their own mortgage, and boy, do you. Everyone has their own income and so forth. So all that has changed, and so we have to now move into this concept that's more like tithing. And the bishop's model for tithing is tithe 10% of your income, half to the parish, and half to all of the other things that you feel moved and inspired to support. So now the gifts are brought forth. They bring forth the bread, the wine, and your, your gifts, your donations to the parish. And those are all brought forth and presented to the priest. And they're brought to the altar. The, the donations are left over here. And then to the altar are brought the bread, the host, and the large ciborium, and the wine. And these are the ciboriums can either be these kind that are stackable, or in our case we have a real a nice large one and some little baby ciborium. And uh, what we do is we take we consecrate them all together, all the hosts, and then we put them into the little ciborium uh, for distribution during communion. And then the water and the wine, those are brought up as and these are called cruets the cruet set, and uh, those are also presented to the priest. Now, uh, what the priest does is he prepares. First of all, he offers the bread of the wine. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It's modeled after the Jewish barakah, the, the, the blessing, the prayer of blessing. And so that's, that's just offering in thanksgiving. Then what the priest does, he takes wine and mixes it with water. Now, why does he do this? Now, the practical reason was because homemade wine tends to be very thick, very viscous, and the chances of getting inebriated are pretty high. So what you do is you dilute it. So we diluted the water, the wine with water. But then that took on a meaning. Quickly, people began to see in that the water and the wine that flowed from the side of our Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 9, 19, verse 34, when he was on the cross and the soldier poked his side and out came water and wine. And the water representing his humanity and the wine, the blood, water and blood, excuse me, and the blood representing his divinity. So, um, by the mingling of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. So we mingle the water and the wine as a symbol of our acknowledgement of the incarnation, that Jesus is God and man, and that he, we too are going to take on his nature, the divinization of all human beings in, when we enter into full union with our Lord. We won't become gods, I'm not saying that, but we take on God's nature. As St. Peter says, we will become like him. We will become like him.